A couple of years ago I saw for the first time Hitchcock's Dial M for Murder. It's a solid little crime and investigation caper with emphasis on psychological games between characters. What bowled me over in this film was how Hitchcock and his cast and crew managed to take long scripted dialogue sequences where characters just talk and talk about basic plot points, yet the scenes end up being surprisingly tense and engaging, and despite the majority of the film taking place in just one room. There's no violence except for one attempted murder scene, there's very little in the way of intense emotional outbursts even though the film is about murder, love affairs and betrayal. Most writers and directors would have these characters frothing at the mouth, screaming in a rage and physically threatening each other. But in Dial M, there's none of that. Characters talk about and do sinister things but with a jarringly calm and jolly demeanour. Instead Hitchcock opts for layers of subtlety in camera work, editing and acting. Little touches that on their own aren't a big deal but when they're piled on collectively they make for a very engaging experience. I'm going to give major plot spoilers before we move on so if you haven't seen the film and want to experience it fresh then stop this video, give the full movie a watch and then come back. With that said, here's the basic plot outline. Tony and Margaret are married, but she has been having a on-off affair with a mystery writer named Mark Halliday. Unknown to Mark and Margaret, Tony knows all about the affair and is planning to have Margaret killed because he has become dependent on her financial security and he knows that she's made out her will to him. Tony has spent a year concocting a master plan that involves blackmailing an old college friend named Swan into committing the murder of his wife for him. The murder is attempted, but Margaret manages to kill Swan in self-defence. From here on, the investigating police gradually try to unravel the motive behind the murder, as Tony uses his cunning to try and cover his tracks. But as we've come to expect from this type of film, the good guys win and the villain is exposed and jailed at the end. The giveaway clue is that Tony had hidden a key under the carpet stairway for the killer to gain entry to the apartment. After the police discover the key, they leave it in place and arrange a scenario by which Tony will reveal his knowledge of the hidden key location, thus linking him directly to the murder plot. The cat and mouse stuff between Tony and the police is very well executed as we'd expect from Hitchcock, but it's like an episode of Columbo in that you know the outcome based on the movie genre that you're watching. But the scene I want to talk about in a lot of detail and which isn't predictable is the blackmail scene in which Tony persuades Swan to commit the murder. This scene is amazing. In basic terms, it's an exposition scene. Exposition is when basic plot points and motivations are communicated through dialogue. Characters stating things both to each other and indirectly to the audience so that they get a full understanding of the circumstances the scene is taking place in. Exposition scenes are usually the most boring scenes in a movie. Audiences tend to remember physically active events or character interactions involving strong emotional displays. But a certain amount of exposition is generally needed because it's hard to otherwise communicate complex plot points. And it's runtime consuming to show everything without having characters just quickly describe it. But exposition scenes don't have to be boring and forgettable as they usually are. The problem is often a case of the nuances of dialogue. In particular, having characters explain obvious points that the audience is already aware of through their own observations of character actions, that's a really good way to make a boring exposition scene. For example, having characters state how they feel emotionally when the expressions and body language of the actor are communicating that information anyway. Another bad approach is having characters explain plot points with words that don't sound natural to the context that they're in. Exposition should sound natural, like the words are what the characters would be saying anyway if there wasn't an audience observing the situation. Characters narrating directly to the audience through the camera or in voiceover is a different matter of course. In those situations it's like the character actually steps out of the narrative for a moment. And another major problem is the lack of physical and visual activity that's usually present in dialogue exposition scenes. The industry standard two-shot setup of a camera over each stationary character's shoulder is so familiar that it's absolutely boring these days. Those shots are almost like still paintings with expositional voices dubbed over them, or like comic strip cells with dialogue bubbles. So let's have a good examination of how Hitchcock and his colleagues handle a 22-minute exposition blackmail scene. 
a scene of just two guys alone together in a room talking and talking and talking for 22 minutes, which is an extremely long chunk of film time. Very few straight dialogue scenes last that long. Not only did they hold our interest for the full 22 minutes, but they imbued the scene with increasing dramatic tension without falling back on standard techniques like accompanying music or intense emotional displays. I'll start with a couple of general points before the chronological breakdown. First is that the characters move around the room a lot. They sit, they stand, they move closer and further from each other. This adds basic visual variety, so we're not looking at the same composition constantly. Combined with this, the camera moves around in a variety of ways, and the camera angles vary from unusual ceiling level views to very unusual ankle level views. The set here is undoubtedly constructed because some of the angles wouldn't be achievable unless walls and portions of floor and ceiling were removed to facilitate those shots. Plus, Hitch tended to prefer stage shoots to location shoots anyway. Sometimes this harmed the integrity of his films because the views out of windows were obviously fake, but this isn't so in Dial M for Murder's apartment scenes. Instead, we get the benefits of greater freedom of camera position. This visual dynamism of camera and character variation in movements and position isn't just eye candy though. Such alterations are frequently linked to the content of the dialogue exposition itself. We'll explore this as we go along. At some points in the scene, camera angles feel almost like we are stalking observers of the situation, like we're hiding and listening. At other points, the camera alters between standing and sitting positions in opposition to the characters, so that we get angle views looking up or down at them. So it's like we are an invisible observer moving about and standing and sitting as we take it all in, like we're there in the room. So the immediate precursor to this scene is that Tony makes a phone call offering to buy a car from someone. To get the person to visit him, he lies that he's got an injured knee, so can't go out. I was rather hoping, I say you couldn't come round to my flat tonight. Where is it? Uh, made a veil, I'd call on you, only I've twisted my knee rather badly. We know from what we've already seen of him that he can walk perfectly fine. So right here off the bat, we know he's up to something. There's a mystery and thus a sense of anticipation. The scene ends with him laying out a pair of latex gloves as well. So more anticipation. Another sense of anticipation was set up early in that Margaret explained to her lover Mark that she had burned all his love letters except one and that the remaining letter went missing and then she began receiving ransom notes threatening to expose her affair. She ended up paying the bribery money. So that's another mystery. Who did the stealing and bribing? With these three mysteries in mind about love letter bribery, Tony lying that he has an injured leg and the latex gloves, we go into the bribery scene. So, hip level angle of Tony preparing to use his cane to fake a sore leg. Right away there's logic in camera position. Hip level view regarding his leg support prop. Doorbell rings and Tony opens it, which motivates camera cut to seeing Swan outside. Immediately they're both using false names. Mr. Fisher? Yes, Captain Lesgit? Yes. Uh, won't you come in? Thank you. Note that the guest is addressed as Captain Lesgit. Military service turns out to be a sore point for this guy later. Tony is Mr. Fisher. That seems like a humorously chosen name because he's about to dangle all kinds of bait to reel Swan into his plot. And Swan is using the name of Mr. Lesgit. Right away we get into mystery identities based on changed names and recognised appearances. Now do sit down. How about a drink? You know, I can't help thinking I've seen you before somewhere. You know, it's funny you should mention that. The moment I opened the door, I... Wait a minute. Lesgit? You're not Lesgit Swan. C.J. Swan. Or was it C.A.? C.A.? Well, you've got a better memory than I have. Fisher. When did we meet? Weren't you at Cambridge? Yes. <laughs> Must be 20 years ago. You wouldn't remember me, I only came here last year. So, old college friend recognition with false jolliness to boot. Note the single wider camera position instead of standard over the shoulder close ups cutting back and forth. And there's logic to this. Cuts to close up in the scene are reserved for key moments. So, still the same shot with Tony, and the next camera cut is motivated by the drink bottle that he shows. The new angle pulls back with Lesgit like we're following his train of thought. 
In stepping away, he is distancing himself from this mysterious man, who he no doubt suspects has invited him here for a different reason. But suave, smiley Tony has his excuses ready to dampen suspicion and switches subject to the issue of buying a car from Lesgit, again allaying suspicion. By the way, how do you know my car's for sale? Your garage told me. That's odd, I don't think I mentioned it to anyone there. Well, I was stopping for a fill-up and I told them I was looking for an American car and they gave me a phone number. I say it is for sale, isn't it? Well, of course. Well, good, but I refuse to discuss the price until you've had at least three brandies. Tony charms him with an offer of several free drinks, yet they each try to underhandedly dominate each other in dialogue about the car price. Well, I warn you, I drive a hard bargain, drunk or sober. So do I. Camera angle here has been slightly above waist height, which facilitates them sitting, but with Tony on the arm of the chair. We could take that as a position of dominance, but in a moment he will do something planned, which is to fetch a photograph on the wall. So it's like the camera is going along with his pre-planned actions, like it's part of his plan itself. But first, Swan is starting to connect the dots. That's it. Wenders. Tony Wenders. What's all this about Fisher? What's all this about Lesgit? Remember I said that Hitch reserves closer shots for key dialogue? Well, that was a good example. What's all this about Fisher? What's all this about Lesgit? Both the closer angle and the unexpected jarring cut give an emotional emphasis on Tony's direct challenge of Swan's use of false names. Plus there's a cut to a closer reaction of Swan as well. For both characters, the false smiles were dropped for a moment and the underlying hostility and distrust revealed. Rather than let this escalate, Tony uses another of his distractive interventions. What's all this about Lesgit? Do you like a cigar? No thanks, I'll just stick to my pipe if you don't mind. Swan's rejection of the offer is a snub, but Tony doesn't care. It was all just a segue into the photo that he wants to show him. And there's one habit you've changed. Oh. I remember at college you always used to smoke rather expensive cigars. Wait a minute, I think I have a picture of you here somewhere. Yes. Yes, here's one. Taken at a reunion dinner. I love this corny photo, by the way. Swan looks like a ventriloquist's dummy. Tony's darker-toned jacket and hair reveal he's being cropped in. And, of course, Hitchcock's obligatory cameo. I don't think Hitch has been cropped in, though. His awkward pose fits too well. So this is probably a picture of some film industry evening that he's attended. I wonder who the other guests are. A slightly odd aspect is how perfectly still the picture and frame are held in front of the camera. No human hand would be this steady, but the point is for us to view the contents of the picture so it doesn't really matter. The dialogue head over this picture is key. Well, that's the first and last reunion I ever went to. What a murderous thug I look. Yes, you do rather. But that's because he actually is a murderer and Tony already knows it and is building slowly up to reveal this. But clever clogs there he is, Tony does everything in subtle incremental steps so as not to arouse unwanted negative reactions. To blackmail Swan, he first needs to reveal that he knows the full extent of Swan's crimes. So he starts with a lesser instance of theft, linking back to their mutual history. Of course, I always remember you because of the college ball. You were the treasurer, weren't you? Honorary treasurer. Oh, I used to organize the beastly things. Yes, some of the ticket money was stolen, wasn't it? That's right, almost a hundred pounds. I'd left it in a cash box in my study and in the morning it had gone. It was the college porter, of course. Yes, of course. Poor old Alfred. He never could back a winner. Yeah, they found the cash box in his back garden. But not the money. He doesn't accuse him outright, but hints that he knows what really happened. These moments where each of them reduce their smiling, reveal truthful points in the conversation, and reveal their hidden tension. And the figure of roughly £100 is important, it pops up again later in a different context. One more detail I think might be relevant here, as they discuss the stolen money, Swan is placing his tobacco pouch deep into his pocket. That might be an additional hint that he pockets the money from the cash box. What follows this seems to be another suggestion of his thieving nature. But not the money. <laughs> Twenty years ago. What are you doing nowadays? I deal in property. Yes, thieves do deal in property, don't they? 
But Swan distances himself from the subject, and Tony, having successfully dropped his hint about the stolen money, takes back control of the conversation by changing subject again. I say, I don't follow tennis very closely. Do you still play? No, I've given up tennis, or rather tennis gave me up. One has to earn a living sometime, and that had a pretty good run for my money. Went round the world three times. <sighs> what are you doing now? Swan doesn't want to talk about his own life, so tries to reverse the interrogation. Tony goes with it like he was probably always planning to do. I sell sports equipment. It's not very lucrative, but it gives me plenty of spare time. His history of being a tennis champion is fitting of his competitive and cunning nature. Their conversation is like a competing tennis match. And what he does next is incredibly smart. Well, I see you managed to run a very comfortable little place. My wife has some money of her own. Otherwise, it would hardly feel like blowing a thousand pounds in your car. Ah, uh, 1,100. Uh, you know, people with capital don't realize how lucky they are. I'm almost resigned to living on what I can earn. Well, you can always marry for money. Yes, I suppose some people make a business out of that. I know I did. Okay, first of all, camera shots. We've been stuck with two almost standard mid shots for basic dialogue reaction for a minute or so. But the camera is at such a low level that it's like we're slouched on a sofa with them. Quite relaxing. But the banality of limited shot variation here allows for an emphasis of the moment when Tony reveals the false basis of his marriage, his own preoccupation with money, and his own conman nature. Second, on a correlationship psychology level, what he's doing is so smart. Instead of coming right out and accusing Swan of being a lying con man, which would provoke a strong reaction and likely make him storm out the room, he instead confesses his own financial troubles and criminal tendency first, particularly the fact that he married his wife for money. This is a step in removing the barriers of polite decency that they both wear as masks. And it's a way of getting Swan to empathise with him as a kindred criminal spirit in desperate need of some cash who has relationships with women as a means of swindling money out of them. As we'll soon find out, that's a game Swan plays very well. Tony even looks genuinely guilty about the issue of his marriage, glancing down, as people do when they're ashamed, and fidgeting with his cane. Oh, one other thing, him revealing that he knows his wife nearly left him, which is something revealed in her scenes with her lover prior to the scene, that statement introduces the idea that he knows about the affair, which he is building up to revealing. This stuff is very smart exposition. Nothing is forced here. It feels like a natural interaction, even though we know by now that they're both liars. And we're witnessing a level of personal manipulation by Tony that's rarely done this convincingly in a movie. And yet there is honesty coming to the surface as part of his manipulation procedure. Very cool. Another point was thrown in here about the psychological games. Tony tried to slyly drop the car price for the car that he's not going to buy. And Swan, keeping track of everything, corrects him. My wife has some money of her own. Otherwise, it would hardly feel like blowing a thousand pounds in your car. Ah, uh, 1100. A big continuity error now. After his confession moments, Tony is suddenly sat forward and upright, chin resting on his hands. But we can see that his confession has won trust. Pouring another drink, Swan is happy to hang around and chat. He's genuinely interested in Tony's scenario, even trying to offer positive consolement. Well, you can always marry for money. Yes, I suppose some people make a business out of that. I know I did. Why do you think she married you? Well, I was a tennis star. Yes, but you've given up tennis. She hasn't left you. I suppose a normal person might raise some sort of critique of Tony for marrying for money, but Swan has been tricked into revealing his approval of that scenario. This progress having been made, there's a big change in camera work and Tony's behaviour. For several moments, they were sat in physical opposition to each other, mostly confined to their own isolating shots, but now a two-shot over Swan's shoulder, both of them in frame together like they're suddenly a bit more connected, Interesting, though, that a table lamp prop visually separates them. Tony stands and walks deceptively away for a moment as he begins explaining how he gradually learned of his wife having an affair. But his real intention, physically, was to come and sit next to Swan, side by side, so that they are like intimate friends sharing sensitive personal information. Ten minutes later, she came out of this house and took a taxi. I took another. Her old school friend lived in the studio in Chelsea. I could see them through the studio window as he cooked spaghetti over a gas ring. They didn't say much, they just looked very natural together. 
You know, it's funny how you can tell when people are in love. This shot is held for a while as Tony talks about stalking his own wife until he saw her with her lover. Swan, enjoying the story and not disapproving of all the stalking, has a gleaming smile and props his arm up, an open gesture of comfort to a close buddy in the moment. And how strange that they are smiling and laughing about a situation that ought to be upsetting for Tony. Seeing your own wife with another man, shouldn't that be upsetting? Shouldn't he be fuming with anger? But no, because he never loved her to begin with. He's indifferent to the point of finding the affair somewhat amusing. And there's an irony. He states, They didn't say much, they just looked very natural together. You know, it's funny how you can tell when people are in love. It's also funny that a man who seems to be incapable of genuine love would be able to recognise it in others. So isn't this all interesting? Secrets are being confided, secrets that ought to be wrought with emotional expression, yet these two may as well be discussing a game of golf they played. Either they mask their emotions extremely well, or they're too psychopathic to have emotions other than mild amusement. Okay folks, time for a commercial break here. For those of you who are not aware, over at my website, which is collativelearning.com, I've got a ton of videos and articles and audio files on film analysis and psychology and so on, which are available for digital download. And these are items that are mostly not available for free on YouTube or any other platform. You have to order the items one by one according to which ones you want to watch. Uh, and the items which are available to order are, are available on the film analysis page and here which is the insight page and that that page I'll just take you quickly to that that page contains videos and articles and some audio files on psychology there's a ton of psychology stuff there uh, there's stuff on video games uh, there's a couple of items on art such as the HR Giga artwork there's a huge study of his work on there so say you wanted to make some orders and you were interested in the HR Giga one, you click view product and you have a little read up, you check out the price and if you like it you say I want this and the item jumps up in there into the corner and you can stack items up there in the corner. Uh, let's say you went back to my previous page and you went to the film analysis page and say you wanted uh, the abyss. You click I want this and you can see that the, the items are stacking up there in the corner. So let me just take you through some of the other things we got. I've got a big video on the movie AI Artificial Intelligence, which, as most of you will know, is a Kubrick and Spielberg collaboration, massively underrated film. So I've got a 147-page analysis uh, of that film in PDF form, but it's got a whole bunch of supporting videos with it. I've uh, got lots of stuff on the Alien films, uh, militarism in the movies of Jim Cameron, two-hour video, stuff on The Exorcist, a two-hour video on Eyes Wide Shut called The Cult of Eyes Wide Shut, and in that one I explore all of the, the various uh, conspiracy interpretations of Eyes Wide Shut, and I assess which ones have got merit and which haven't, to give you my final conclusions on that. Let's see his uh, Full Metal Jackets, you know, tons of Kubrick stuff here, a huge study on uh, Mad Max 2, The Road Warrior, Nightmare on Elm Street, two and a half hour analysis, Predator, two hour, 20 minute analysis, uh, stuff on Pulp Fiction, Robocop, Risky Business, Saving Private Ryan, Scarface, lots of stuff on The Shining, Silence of the Lambs, Starship Troopers, tons of stuff here for you to sink your teeth into. So if you're ever, if you're ever bored with waiting around for me to post new content, because sometimes it takes me a few weeks between projects, then just have it over to the site and place a few orders. And once you've picked the items that you want uh, and they've stacked up in the corner there, you click pay. And you can select to use your credit card or PayPal. It's all secure. I've been using this selling system for many years now. And there's never been a problem with people's personal data being breached or anything like that. And if there's ever a difficulty with the order, you can contact me very easily. There's a short video explaining how to place the orders and a little bit of a write-up here about it as well. Okay, so if you're interested in that stuff, then head over to my website, which is collativelearning.com. And now, back to the video. Carrying on. I went for a walk. I began to wonder what would happen if she left me. I have to find some way of earning a living to begin with. 
I suddenly realized how much I'd grown to depend on her. All these expensive tastes I'd acquired while I was at the top. So he's not concerned about losing the love of his wife, but rather losing her money, and something else just occurred. As Tony is relaying the story, parts of his story are acted out in his physical movements, such as standing and walking as he speaks of going for a walk. I went for a walk. I began to wonder what would happen if she left me. Although he physically separates himself from Swan, they are still framed together in the same shot. As a side note, all of these intricate stories about past events conveyed in dialogue by Tony cause we the viewers to visualise those events in our minds. It makes us run an internal movie in parallel with what's being shown on screen. This internal movie involves lots of locations, but without Hitchcock and his team having to actually film them. All of that stuff could have been filmed and shown, but it would have taken up huge amounts of screen time. So, condensing it in dialogue explanation is fine, especially being that it's all framed in a mystery of what the hell is Tony getting at? Swan's curiosity matches our own. So, sitting on the chair arm, in a higher dominant position perhaps, he finally latches onto the subject of murdering his wife's lover, which prompts a cut to close-up of Swan, not necessarily reacting, but keenly curious. I dropped into a pub and had a couple of drinks. As I sat in the corner, I thought of all sorts of things. I thought of three different ways of killing him. His lack of startled reaction is kind of a giveaway in itself. Tony then switches to the subject of killing his wife instead of the lover being preferable. And note the very odd panning shot of Swan. I even thought of killing her. And that seemed a far more sensible idea. And just as I was working out how I could do it, I suddenly saw something which completely changed my mind. Why the strange shot? Well, Tony just said of the past that he saw something which, as we'll find out in a minute, was Swan himself. I think that's why the pan towards Swan, a sort of camera work reenactment of Tony having seen Swan when he was in the pub thinking about how to kill his wife. Tony now pauses a moment as if waiting for Swan to ask, well, what did you see? And just as I was working out how I could do it, I suddenly saw something which completely changed my mind. I didn't go to that tournament after all. But since Swan doesn't ask yet, Tony moves on with his story. As he does so, he gets up and walks about for a moment before sitting down again. Doesn't seem to be any apparent reason for that other than keeping things varied visually, but he draws an analogy between his past and present, prompting a kind of reenactment framing. When I got back, she was sitting exactly where you are now. And I told her I decided to give up tennis and look after her instead. As he sits down, cut to ankle level shot of them both. Like with many shots in this scene, this is the camera angle anticipating what's coming next. So now he gets on to revealing that he stole the love letter. There were long letters from there. They usually arrived on Thursdays. And she burned them all except one. That one she used to transfer from handbag to handbag. It was always with her. That letter became an obsession with me. I had to find out what was in it. And finally I did. That letter made very interesting reading. Do you mean you stole it? Yes. I even wrote her two anonymous notes offering to sell it back. Again, this is creepy behaviour, but spoken of like he's merely describing afternoon tea. Swan responds to this part of the story by smiling at the notion of theft. He also places his glass down, which is sort of a narrative requirement for what's going to happen next as well. Swan needs to have his hands free at a key moment. I even wrote her two anonymous notes offering to sell it back. Why? I was hoping you would make her come and tell me all about him. Tony reveals he sent the blackmail letter in the hope of making his wife confess the affair to him. So, maybe he does have feelings for her after all, though he doesn't seem bothered by the contents of the letter. That letter made very interesting reading. He takes out and drops the letter, anticipating that Swan will lean forward and pick it up. I think it would have been better if this was done with Tony standing to ensure that Swan would be the one who picked it up. From this position, he could have just sat there. Having Swan open and read the letter would have ensured that his fingerprints would be all over it and not just on the envelope, but these are minor errors. The interaction is still fascinating. 
Something particularly interesting is that Tony didn't respond with overt anger to his knowledge of his wife's affair or reading the love letter. Either he lacked feeling, like a psychopath, or he has such self-discipline that he contained his feelings. He hid them. So as Swan has the letter and hands it back, he finally pops the important question. Why are you telling me all this? And the reply only serves to heighten interest. Because you're the only person I can trust. Sounds like a compliment, but we'll soon find out it's an insult. As Tony gets the letter back, he says... Anyway, that did it. It certainly did. Swan has just put his fingerprints on the letter, sealing his fate in the blackmail transaction. So now Tony brings everything back to the moment where he was in a pub planning to kill his wife and again gives Swan the chance to ask what he saw. It must have put the fear of God into them because the letter stopped and we lived happily ever after. You know, it's funny to think that just a year ago I sat in that Knightsbridge pub actually planning to murder her. And I might have done it if I hadn't seen something that changed my mind. Well, what did you see? I saw you. What was so odd about that? The coincidence. Nice piece of choreography there too. Swan has to turn around to empty his pipe into the ashtray. This allows for a shock reaction conveyed not by overreacted facial expression, but by pausing and slowly turning his head. It's a great aspect of this scene. Emotional reactions are often communicated by changes of posture, position in the room, and camera angle rather than their actual facial expressions. That early point I made about close-ups for key moments is at play again here too. And I believe for the first time in this whole scene, a character looks directly into the camera while reacting and speaking, placing even more emphasis on this pivotal moment of the conversation. An important question here is whether Tony is giving a truthful or distorted version of past events. Did he really see Swan in a pub by coincidence? Or had he actually hunted him down? Although this would have been difficult given his name changes. Tony has virtually got him on the hook now and is about to more aggressively reel him in. But first he has a moment of eyeing his prey like a hawk while his head is turned away. These little momentary slips of his mask are great. Not too obvious, just natural looking. So we now start announcing his awareness of Swan's life of crime, beginning of course with long past issues so we can build up to the more emotionally charged current ones. The first issue relates back to the start of the scene. You see, only a week before I'd been to a reunion dinner and the fellows were talking about you, how you'd been court-martialed during the war, a year in prison, that was news. Remember when he answered the door to Swan, he had referred to him as Captain Lesgit? So it seems that Swan had been adopting a false military identity in opposing contrast to his real history of military service in which he was court-martialed. I suppose in a way it would be a pretty good cover because in talking about his military history he could refer to real events and thus make it convincing but without, of course, telling people about the court-martial aspect. Also, what was he court-martialed for? Was it theft? Tony carries on and brings up the cash box college incident again, but jestingly passes off his accusation as common knowledge, so that it seems less like a personal attack. Mind you, at college we'd all said that old Swan would end up in jail, that cash box, I suppose. Well, what about it? Oh, my dear fellow, everybody knew you took that money. Poor old Alfred. Thanks very much for the drink. Interesting hearing about your matrimonial affair. Swan finally turns hostile, but still reasonably polite. But Tony has anticipated this and reels him back in with the offer of an explanation. I take it you won't be wanting that car after all. Don't you want me to tell you why I brought you here? Yes, I think you'd better. We get another of those moments now in which dialogue about a past event parallels the present. It was when I saw you in that pub that it happened. Suddenly everything became quite clear. Well, everything did just become quite clear to Swan via the revelation that Tony doesn't actually need a walking stick. So Swan has walked into a blackmail trap. And the cleaning of Swan's fingerprints from props in the room 
is a good indicator that the meeting they're having is just between them and not to be revealed to anyone. In turn, this very subtly suggests that he wants Swan to kill his wife. Now, a person who hadn't committed any major crimes would confidently tell Tony to go fuck himself and walk out, but Swan desperately needs to know which of his major crimes Tony has unraveled. So he stays and hears him out. He stands like a kid who's been caught out with his hand in the cookie jar as Tony strolls around him and announces his need for an alibi. Now that's tricky because, as we'll soon find out, he wants Swan to be the killer, not the alibi. So it keeps him listening. He now more or less directly insults Swan, even looking him in the eye close up as he implies that Swan has no friends. I'd often wondered what happened to people when they came out of prison. People like you, I mean. Can they get jobs? Do old friends rally around? Suppose they never had any friends. Then he announces he's been following Swan about, and he says this very close to him with no fear of angry reprisal. I became so curious to know that I followed you. I followed you home that night. He even asserts his dominance over Swan by asking him to pass the glass so that he can wipe his fingerprints from it. Swan obeys because he's effectively been baited already, he just doesn't know the details yet. And Tony keeps up the false politeness with a hearty thank you. And would you mind passing me your glass, old boy? Thank you, thank you very much. Swan raises the magic word, blackmail, but socially polite, slick-mouthed Tony reframes it with a deceptively polite-sounding word. I've been following you ever since. Why? I was hoping that sooner or later I might catch you at something and be able to, uh... Blackmail me? Influence you. Isn't he a charmer? Swan's guilty conscience impels him to now place his hands in his pockets. The hiding of hands is often associated with the desire to hide emotional responses. For one thing, our hands tremble when we're afraid. Just for clarity, by the way, I'm not saying that Hitchcock requested all of these little specific body language details from his actors. I'll bet that they came up with a lot of it themselves, because good actors can do that. They mentally write the body language that isn't contained in the script. The threshold has been crossed now. Swan knows that he is being blackmailed and has offered nothing in the way of resistance. So Tony now merely has to lay out the scenario for him but he still does it with an extremely polite, courteous and delicate manner that actually isn't needed. He's got Swan cornered and he could just now bluntly state the facts rapidly and order him to commit the murder of his wife. Yet, he opts for the drawn out, gentle process. Is this because he enjoys exercising his manipulative social muscles, relishing the sense of subtle power? Or is it because, in spite of being cold enough to murder his wife, He's actually a genuinely considerate guy, even in a situation like this. A lot like Hannibal Lecter, really. Actually, I would have liked to have seen this guy play Hannibal Lecter. He would have been amazing. But at the same time, it could be that his calm, gentle approach is just a logical means of ensuring that Swan accepts the information without triggering a panic reaction that could lead to a violent conflict between them in this situation. Carrying on with the details, Tony announces that he's got Swan by the balls, and as he begins to elaborate, camera dollies into Swan, who, like Tony, is doing a sterling job of disguising the swarm of emotions and tension that he must be feeling. You became quite fascinating. In fact, there were times when I felt that you uh, almost belonged to me. That must have been interesting. Now Tony has moved away, and for the first time in this scene, propped himself against his desk, a symbol of officiality, and which is typically associated with documents of financial dealings. So he's physically moved away to this distant desk position and has crossed his arms, which is often a subconscious indication of intention to defend against some expected hostility. Why do this at this point in the conversation? Simple, because he's about to announce the first example of Swan's present day illegal activities. In fact, there was nothing really illegal about you. I got quite discouraged. Then one day you disappeared from your lodgings. I phoned your landlady. I said, Mr. Adams owed me five pounds. Well, apparently that was nothing. Mr. Adams owed her six weeks rent and her best lodger 55 pounds. And Mr. Adams had been such a nice gentleman. That was incredibly sneaky. Phoning the landlady and mentioning that Swan owed him just five pounds was the perfect way of eliciting information from her about who else he owed money to. 
The act of phoning Swan's landlord was also the first admitted example of Tony interfering in Swan's personal life. These two revelations risked a physical outburst from Swan, so Tony got himself out the way and across the room. But Swan has no outburst. Instead, he reaches for another drink to calm his nerves. And so, with a smug grin, Tony walks straight back over to him to tell him not to get his fingerprints on anything and to continue revealing the extent of his stalking of Swan and the illegal activities he's discovered. His excuse for name changing was lame as hell, by the way. You'd uh, change your name to Adams? Yes, I got bored with Swan. Any crime in that? No, no, none whatever. So, a knee-level camera angle now. Unusual. As Tony continues to reveal what he's learned about Tony's criminal activities. He does so for a few moments up close, close enough for Swan to feel his breath on his face. He reveals his knowledge of Swan using a third name and of being involved in swindling another woman. And look at his fingers. He's rubbing them together in a gesture, what we culturally associate as a reference to money and sometimes demand for payment. Despite this being just two guys chatting in a room, the scene is full of rapid fire conveying of information verbally and non-verbally. I think that's one of the reasons the scene is so engaging. We have to give our full attention to keep track of the plot details alone, never mind the non-verbal interactions and unusual camera angles. This low angle, for example, is something I've seen in loads of Hitchcock scenes, a kind of voyeur viewpoint, like we're in the room and spying on these men from behind furniture. Though Hitch tended to do this more with voyeuristic views of characters through doorways, but in this case the shot anticipates Tony sitting down in a different chair, one that hasn't been sat in yet in this scene. Again, the implication is that Tony's movements about the room aren't random. He has thought all this stuff out very carefully. He's probably rehearsed this very blackmail performance for months. Swan is in the dock and has no intention of walking out the room. There Mr. Adams became Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson left Belsize Park owing 16 weeks rent and somewhat richer for a brief encounter with a Miss, a Miss Wallace. He used to take Miss Wallace out on Wednesdays and Sundays. She certainly was in love with you, wasn't she? I suppose she thought you were growing that handsome moustache to please her. Poor Miss Wallace. This is all very interesting. Do go on. That's outright permission for Tony to state his blackmail terms. Tony also threw in a statement implying something bad had happened to this particular woman. I suppose she thought you were growing that handsome moustache to please her. Poor Miss Wallace. Tony, in using the phrase poor Miss Wallace, is also mimicking the potential public reaction that might occur if what Swan did to her were ever revealed. Strange angle now of Tony. A chunk of the floor must have been removed to get this shot. Tony doesn't say what happened to Miss Wallace, but rather he outlines Swan's next female victim, and this time with a level of detail that reveals not only he has been following Swan, but he's been doing some extensive research about the lives of his victims. July, August, September, apartment 127, Carlisle Court, occupant of Mrs. Van Dorn. Her late husband left her two hotels and a large apartment house furnished. What a base to operate from, Captain Lesgit. The only trouble is, she does rather enjoy being courted, and she's so very expensive. Okay, so there's a weird thing going on now. Tony is a criminal, of course, but he's acting like a police detective. This helps set up the cat and mouse game he'll play later in the film to try and cover up his tracks when the murder of his wife fails. The fact that he can think and act like a detective gives him an edge. He further demonstrates his detective ability. Perhaps that's why I've been trying to sell her car for over a month. Mrs. Van Dorn asked me to sell it for her. I know, I called her up just before you arrived here. She only wanted 800. Caught out on the car sale issue, we get closer shot of Swan as he takes a few steps away, indicating a sudden desire to wriggle out of the blackmail trap. Where's the nearest police station? Opposite the church, two minutes walk. Suppose I walk there now. What would you tell them? Everything. Everything? All about Mr. Adams and Mr. Wilson? Swan tries to mount a challenge by stepping back toward Tony, a subtle sign of aggression, and trying to flush Tony out in the open. I should simply tell them that you're trying to blackmail me into... Into? Murdering your wife. I almost wish you would. When she heard that, we'd have the biggest laugh of our lives. But Tony has no intention of stating that intention verbally, and he's sticking to that position. 
Note the views of Tony switching from here to here. The camera yet again switching position to indicate little shifts in the verbal content of the discussion. Swan is a bit more stern in his challenge, but Tony counters this with a jolly smile and calm voice. Aren't you forgetting something? Am I? You've told me quite a lot tonight. What of it? Suppose I tell them how you followed her to that studio in Chelsea and watched them cooking spaghetti and all that rubbish. Wouldn't that ring a bell? Oh, it certainly would. They'd assume you followed her there yourself. And that works pretty well, actually. Talk calmly and happily to a person who is trying to be hostile, and it tends to disarm them. But at the same time, Tony announces his readiness to frame Swan for something he didn't do. They'd assume you followed her there yourself. Me? Why should I? Why should you steal her handbag? Why should you write her all those blackmail notes? Can you prove you didn't? You certainly can't prove I did. It'll be a straight case of your word against mine. That'd puzzle them, wouldn't it? What could you say? I should simply say that you came here tonight half drunk and uh, tried to borrow money on the strength that we were at college together. When I refused, you mentioned something about a letter belonging to my wife. As far as I could make out, you're trying to sell it to me. I gave you what money I had, and you gave me the letter. It has your fingerprints on it, remember? What's smart about that is he's reserved the threat aspect of the blackmail plan until Swan threatened to go to the police, thus framing his attack as a polite defence. Jesus, with these skills, Tony should be a PR manager for big corporations and governments. He's like Dracula, charming, hypnotic, and deadly. The announcement of Swan's fingerprints on the letter is a very risky part of this conversation. Swan can be seen responding to this by taking his hands from his pockets. In an argument, doing this is often a subconscious expression of a desire to fist fight the opponent. There was a risk here that Swan might have physically tried to take the letter from Tony and resort to violence to do so. But Tony has shown so much cunning anticipation that Swan is probably scared to do anything for fear of triggering some other trap that Tony has waiting. Incidentally, Tony mentions the issue that he could say Swan turned up half drunk. He has had a couple of glasses, which is an interesting choice. On the one hand, giving Swan drinks was likely done to soften him up for the blackmail news, but at the same time, the influence of alcohol could have backfired and caused a physical backlash. So, as Tony outlines the possibility of negative press coverage for Swan and the possibility of more victims coming forward, Swan has to sit as if to stop himself from losing balance in the face of great fear. He even has to break eye contact as well, an indirect admission of his guilty conscience. Tony starts going into depth about Miss Wallace. He glances at his fingernails here, which is odd because I'd already noticed that his thumbnail was very long. Long, well-groomed nails on a man can be a sign of great self-control because it indicates the guy doesn't bite his nails out of habitual momentary anxiety like a lot of people do. Another aspect of him looking at his hands is that his hands are calm, no jitters of nervousness given the sinister conversation. With Swan having broken eye contact, Tony knows he's got him cornered and petrified. So rather than just let him avoid eye contact, Tony gets up and approaches. Swan responds by turning his back completely to Tony. Tony goes beyond mere observations and research into Swan's life by anticipating one of Swan's future motives. You usually met in out-of-the-way places where you wouldn't be recognised. Like the little tea shop in Pimlico. That was her idea, not mine. Yes, it was a bit crummy, wasn't it? Hardly the place to take Mrs. Van Dorn. By the way, does Mrs. Van Dorn know about Mr. Adams and Mr. Wilson and Miss Wallace? You were planning to marry Mrs. Van Dorn, weren't you? Smart, aren't you? He knows his prey inside out. He's been stalking the stalker, and he ought to know Swan's motive because he married for money himself and has already made that confession. So strangely, the blackmail involves a kindred criminal spirit revelation. Tony uses that anticipation of Swan's marrying for money motive to lead into the next anticipation, the most important one. You were planning to marry Mrs. Van Dorn, weren't you? Smart, aren't you? No, not really. I've just had time to think things out, put myself in your position. That's why I know you're going to agree. Swan asks a silly question that he already knows the answer to. What makes you think I'll agree? So Tony appropriately gives an insulting answer. For the same reason that a donkey with a stick behind him and a carrot in front always goes forwards and not backwards. Tony gives this insult while glancing at books on the shelf and taking his eyes off Swan, 
Like he's so calm and confident about how the blackmail is going that he's getting a bit bored and feels the urge to go read something less predictable than Swan himself. Swan's next question basically reveals that he's at least half accepted the threat aspect of the blackmail. Tell me about the carrot. And Tony's response plays to his core motive in life, money. One thousand pounds in cash. Swan recovers eye contact now that he's been offered the carrot. For a murder, for a few minutes work, that's all it is. Another verbal reframe by Tony. He has no intention of ever actually asking Tony outright to kill his wife. Incidentally, the offering of the thousand pound was framed by Tony putting his hand into his pocket like he's reaching for loose change to bribe the idiot before him. The donkey comment was a you're an idiot gesture. For the same reason that a donkey with a stick behind him and a carrot in front always goes forwards and not backwards. Now that the positive money reward has been offered, Tony can safely announce the worst of his revelations about Swan's criminal behaviour, the murder of Miss Wallace. For a few minutes work, that's all it is. And no risk, I guarantee. That ought to appeal to you. You've been skating on pretty thin ice. I don't know what you're talking about. You ought to know. It was in all the papers. Middle-aged woman found dead due to an overdose of something. Apparently she'd been taking the stuff for quite some time and nobody knows where she got it. But we know, don't we? Poor Miss Wallace. A different camera shot singles out Swan's most anxious moment yet and possibly even his remorse. It looks like he's gonna faint. And like with the intended murder of his own wife, Tony doesn't refer to Miss Wallace's death as a murder. Apparently she'd been taking the stuff for quite some time and nobody knows where she got it. But we know, don't we? Again, this is so important regarding exposition scenes. Instead of just stating things really bluntly, hint at them. Without even having to think about it, Swan swallows the bait. He has to commit a murder to avoid being found guilty of murder. His next question implies readiness to do just that. A thousand pounds. What is it? Both men are also stepping away from each other now. The personal, intimate aspects of the discussion are over, so now it's a business meeting. Tony, on the other hand, seems to have anticipated this moment of willingness because he's already on his way to his desk to fetch the upfront cash portion of the bargain. PR salesman, as always, Tony refers to the murder as delivering the goods. Of course, we don't meet again. As soon as you've delivered the goods, I shall mail you the checkroom ticket and the key to the case. Take this hundred pounds on account. The throwing of the money across the room involves the only rapid camera movement of the scene, being that the sight of actual cash must be a thrill for Swan anyway. All Swan wants now is to ensure that he'll be paid and the money untraceable. Rubbing the ring on his little finger, Swan is considering. I wonder if that's a signet ring. Back in the day, signet rings, which are used to impress the wearer's emblem into the wax of sealed documents, were always worn on the left little finger. You know the police would only have to trace one of these notes back to you to hang us both from the same rope? They won't. Swan has raised his concerns not about himself, but about their mutual danger, and he talked of them being hung by the same rope. The contract has unofficially been sealed, and so have their mutual fates, effectively. If the plan succeeds, they go free, but if it fails, they both do time. With Swan walking across the room, Hitch opts for another of those voyeuristic camera angles, like we're hiding behind this lamp as we witness the contract for murder. Shrewd Swan has asked to see his accounts, and now they're in partnership. The two are in shot close together. Oh, your balance has dropped by over a thousand pounds during the year. Suppose the police ask you about that. I go dog racing twice a week. Well, check your bookmaker. Like you, I always bet on the tote. Satisfied? Swan, being a man of crime, can anticipate some of the police procedures for investigating murder, as can Tony. By the way, the cash amounts are interesting. One thousand pounds plus one hundred pounds on account. The sale of Miss van der Vaughan's car was originally touted at 1100 Makes sense, really. Swan came here for 1100 and that's what he's getting. Another revealing detail is that Tony has been very gradually withdrawing money over the past year and attending dog races as a cover for the withdrawals. So it seems the £1,000 aspect of the blackmail plan was decided by him a long time ago. And finally, we have a small outburst from Swan. 
When would this take place? Tomorrow night. Tomorrow? Not a chance. The only outburst of the scene, really. But Tony doesn't want him to think long about it and find a way to back out. He has to make him do the deed while he's baited. I've got to think this over. It has to be tomorrow. I've arranged things that way. So next up, another weird instance of parallel between the present and a past or future event. This time, the future. Where? Approximately where you're standing now. And that's the ideal setup for a total change in the tone of the scene. The details of the plan are relayed from a top-down view, like the room and the men in it have suddenly become an instructional floor plan. The key moment of Tony showing Swan where the key to the apartment will be waiting for him involves an unusual cut. Same camera angle, but zoomed in. So, the plan is explained more. But he's so sinister he is intending on listening over the phone as the murder of his wife takes place. I shall dial the wrong number. This number. That's all I shall do. When the phone rings, you'll see the light go on under her bedroom door. When she opens it, the light will stream across the room. So don't move until she answers the phone. There must be as little noise as possible. After you've finished, pick up the phone and give me a soft whistle. Then hang up. Don't speak whatever you do. I shan't say a word. Is that because he's going to enjoy listening to it? As part of the briefing, the suitcase has already been placed by, in waiting, by Tony. He's that meticulous. And cut to close up for another key moment. By this door? Yes. And here's the most important thing. As you go out, return the key to the place where you found it. Under the stair carpet? Yes. Now Tony describes the murder itself, but only describes it as an aftermath. Well, they'll assume you came in by the window. You thought the apartment was empty, so you took the suitcase and went to work. She heard something. She switched on her light. You saw the light under the door and hid behind the curtains. When she came in here, you attacked her before she could scream. When you realized you'd actually killed her, you panicked, bolted through the garden and left the loot behind you. He still hasn't actually said, I want you to kill my wife and he reiterates the murder intention in another implied statement without an actual admission. You see, she often takes a walk around the garden before she goes to bed, and she usually forgets to lock up when she gets back. That's what I shall tell the police. Yes, but she may say that. But she isn't going to say anything, is she? And a unique camera position for the key moments again. By unique, I mean an angle that is shown for the very first time in the scene. Swan, carrying on with questions, makes the mistake of getting his fingerprints on the back of the chair and door handle, but Tony has spotted this and will remedy both in a minute. Note that Swan has continued twiddling that little finger signet ring during most of this, if it's a signet ring. Tony cleaning the fingerprints gives justification to keeping the camera moving about so it all doesn't get visually boring. Now an unexpected phone call. How many keys are there to this door? Just hers and mine. Tony looks more uncomfortable with this than anything else that's transpired in this scene. And this is a strange double narrative moment, one of those bits where Hitch has two stories going on at once, one being a verbal conversation that we hear, and the other being the actions of another character that we can see. Look, why don't you take Mark to Jerry's? How do we get in? Well, just mention my name. I don't know about the band, but the food's good. By the way, Maureen called up just after you left and wants us for dinner on Wednesday. But you've got something written in your diary for Wednesday and I can't read your writing. Our intrigue is maintained in that it's hard to keep conscious track of the two sets of details at once. So, visually, big changes in lighting of the set, both for variation and as part of Swan rehearsing the intended murder. And the conversation details? Margaret says she's enjoying every minute of the play that she's gone to see with Mark, and Tony says he's sorry and then corrects himself. It's really a dreadful play. We're enjoying every minute. Oh, I'm sorry. I mean, I'm glad. You will. He's also distracted by keeping an eye on Swan. Oh, darling, just a moment. I think there's someone at the door. Psst. You can be seen from the bedroom window. And that thing about enjoying every minute of the play, which is what she says over the phone, that might be a jokey nudge to us about enjoying every minute of the play that we've been watching in this room. 
Tony makes another verbal slip up while he's distracted. He accuses his wife of having another boyfriend. But you've got something written in your diary for Wednesday and I can't read your writing. Looks like Al Bentor. Who's he? Another one of your boyfriends? So now we know that Tony is a great long-term planner, but when faced with sudden unexpected events like this phone call, he's prone to making mistakes. This is how he gets caught later. So, phone conversation over, the co-conspirators staring at each other from afar, no more smiles from either of them. Swan is about to make his final decision, and Tony has his hand resting on and then near the phone, like he's planning to make a call if Swan defies him. But I think it's a metaphor more generally of him being at the ready to relay information to someone else, info that Swan doesn't want him to reveal. So he grabs the money and we get the first and only music of the whole 22 minute scene to punctuate his commitment to kill Margaret. A pretty shaky move of the camera toward him, I think I'd have cut away sooner to remove that shaky last couple of seconds. And close up of Tony, now smiling again, and fade to black. 22 minutes of guys talking, expositional dialogue in a room, and the whole thing is really captivating. I must shout out on behalf of the actors here too. What a job, especially Ray Milland as Tony the Blackmailer, one of his career high points as an actor. His polite delivery in the face of sinister plot information even extends to his arrest for attempted murder of his wife at the end of the movie. He's caught out regarding the key, and after a very brief panic moment where the mask slips and he attempts to run out the room, we can see the fear still in his face, but he maintains civility by offering a farewell drink to his wife, her lover, and the cop who caught him. Well, as you said, Mark, it uh, might work out on paper, but uh, congratulations, Inspector. Oh, by the way... Well, how about you, Margot? Yes, I could do with something. Mark? So can I. I suppose you're still on duty, Inspector. Talk about losing with humility. It's like the whole affair was just a jolly old game of chess or a family evening of Monopoly. I think filmmakers hoping to shoot straight dramas with no special effects or explosions can learn a great deal from studying the sophistication of this 22 minute classic Hitchcock scene. Thanks for watching, more film analysis at collativelearning.com.